Welcome back, everyone, to the Centre for Progressive Policy's Inclusive Growth Conference. I hope you had a good little break there. A reminder to those of you joining by Zoom, you can use the Q&A function to ask any questions you'd like to, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, we're also live streaming via YouTube on the website, and you can get in touch with us on Twitter using the hashtag IGConf2021. And we're also on Facebook Live. So please do get in touch. We really do want to hear from you. Our first topic now is uh, really going to get us stuck in, elbow deep, into the ideas that we want to take a good look at this afternoon. The topic is Beyond Roads and Railways, Making Leveling Up Work for Cities. Chairing it is Charlotte Aldrit, the director of CPP, and joining her on the panel are John Stevenson. He's the Conservative MP for Carlisle and co-chair of the APPG for Key Cities. Lord O'Neill, Jim O'Neill, is an economist and is vice chair of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership, chair of Northern Gritston and a former commercial secretary to the Treasury. Julia Goldsworthy is a former Liberal Democrat MP and is now former director of strategy at the West Midlands Combined Authority, which uh, works to unlock the region's full economic potential for the benefit of everyone that lives there. I think, Charlotte, it's over to you. I'm going to leave you in charge. Thank you. So at CPP, we're interested in place. We think it's where these abstract ideas of productivity and even the, the very concept of the economy really plays out. It's where social and economic comes, policy comes together and, and, and lives for real. Um, cities were once all the rage and Jim and I worked together um, several years ago now on the City Growth Commission. Um, they have seemed to go out a little bit out of fashion since the 2019 election when um, Boris won a, a range of towns and, and a lot has been talked about towns. But I think we're going to get into a conversation uh, today about how important cities are to the government's macroeconomic agenda and, its contrib and their contribution to levelling up, both in terms of the challenges that uh, they face and the opportunities that they present. So this session really reclaims the city and I'm delighted that we're connecting in with the Bristol Festival of Ideas as they think about the future city. So hello to everybody um, in Bristol that's joining in for this session here today. So we are very much awaiting the government's levelling up white paper. We've obviously got the budget and the spending review next week and we're certainly hoping to hear more on what levelling up is, what the government's going to do about it and how much money it's going to put behind it. So um, I think that's a, a great way of then handing over to um, our Conservative MP for Carlisle, John, who's going to tell us a little bit more about um, what he's experienced and seen in his city and, and what he's expecting from that white paper. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, Charlotte, and delighted to be here. Um, I'd like to start my remarks actually talking about the city we're in, London. I think we recognise London as a world city. It is hugely successful. But I think the real success of London is actually how it has influenced the places around it, how the economic success of London has permeated out to other parts of the South. And what I would like to see ultimately is the other cities of this country doing something similar. So you've got Manchester, Leeds, seeing those being so successful that it again permeates out to other parts of the area that they are in. And if you go to a smaller scale, my own constituency and city of Carlisle, there's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't be the economic driver for that region. The problem, as I think we've all uh, acknowledged, is our cities have not been as successful as they could be. London, yes, and maybe Bristol and some others have been fairly successful, but I think we need to see the other cities step up and become far more uh, dynamic and um, successful economically and beyond. Leveling up agenda is very much part of government's policy. It was a key part of the 2019 manifesto. Everybody argues, what is leveling up all about? For me, is two very simple things. First of all, it's about improving people's lives. And secondly, it's about closing the gap between other parts of the country and indeed London and the South. It is about moving up, leveling up. How do we go about doing that? Well, if you go back actually to the origins of leveling up, which in many respects was the Northern Powerhouse concept, which George Osborne set out in 2014 and which Jim was very much part of, it's about connectivity, it's about improving the connections between particularly the, the cities. I take a northern perspective very much about the connectivity between places like Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds and across to the east. 
but it's also about skills, it's about the environment, it's about devolution, and it's also about private sector investment. So I think those are the, 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 the areas where I think we need to see improvement. The challenge to government, I think, is primarily threefold. It is first that improving skills, not so much at the university element, but very much in the school, the technical, the college element. And it cannot be seen in isolation, because I think the great risk is you improve the skills in the north of England, for example, and what happens, unless the jobs are there, they'll all head off to London and the south in the first place, because that's where the opportunities are. So we've got to make sure that we have joined up thinking here. So skills undoubtedly is going to be one of the primary um, drivers of change in the north. But combine that also with devolution. We have to accept we are an over-centralised country. We need to decentralise powers, give communities and leaders in those communities real powers to do things in their locality. Mayors, I think, are a great vehicle for achieving that. I think we're starting to see that being demonstrated by Andy Burnham in Manchester, Ben Houchen in the north, Andy Street in the Midlands. And I think expanding the concept of mayors out would be very beneficial, but it's also got to be combined with real powers and real devolution. And then the third equation is private sector investment. At the end of the day, it is they that create the wealth, the jobs, the opportunities. But the, gov the challenge to the government is how do you actually incentivize businesses not necessarily to come to London in the south, but to look to invest elsewhere. And I give a very simple example of my own constituency. We have a Pirelli plant. It's been there 50 years. It was a direct consequence of economic policy of the government 50 years ago. But for the last 50 years, we've had 400 to 500 million pounds of benefit going into our local economy because of that, creating 800 well-paid skilled jobs. So we've got to look at how we can incentivize the private sector to come as well, along with the skills and along with the devolution. And I think those are the three key factors that can deliver, I think, a better balanced country. Wonderful, thanks, John. Um, Jim, I know that education is something close to your heart, education yeah. and skills. Yeah. Leveling up for you. I mean, just a couple of things before I answer that question. Um, I, I, I like how you introduced uh, the issues, and, and it does seem, for reasons that seem a bit weird to me, that there's a shift away from big cities. But I detect at the margin a bit of a shift back, which I hope I'm right about because it's really important. Uh, from a, from as you and I showed and all our team in the Cities Growth Commission report, unless you can really influence the growth performance of the, you know, the 14 places in the UK that have more than half a million people, you can't improve the national economic performance. Irrelevance of how many small towns you try and help. I think there is some fresh realisation of that, and I hope I'm right. Uh, I have to say, secondly in this regard, John, I want to again say publicly what, what John's done uh, about some of the, the dilemmas about areas that aren't thought about when you focus on cities with the so-called borderlands has been a fantastic uh, thing that I think in itself uh, should be, uh, given what they're achieving, uh, a stimulus to how others should think about how to approach credible ways of trying to do this. On your question, yeah, uh, you know, what, uh, what the hell is levelling up? Uh, you know, we'll find out perhaps when this much, yet another much delayed white paper finally comes out, uh, but maybe we won't. Um, but of all the things that are uh, relevant, and I take it for granted, a lot of it will be place-based. Uh, there was an intellectual case for saying maybe the, a lot of it shouldn't be, but it will be. Um, ultimately, I believe it should be about educational opportunity. And especially if you look at the the long, long-term, uh, deep-seated problems about regional inequalities in this country, you can trace a lot of them, or they seem to have an enormous correlation with educational underperformance. Parts of the Midlands, uh, actually probably more the East than the West, and across, not, not everywhere in the North. The North is kind of very intriguing in this regard. There's huge diversity, but in a good 30 plus areas, Unless you give devoted attention to educational challenges there, you aren't going to make a difference. And so uh, the two things that I plead for, and I'm, frankly, I'm not sure 
it is something the government yet really realizes, is a much more serious approach to so-called opportunity areas, which needs a refresh anyhow, where they're trying to deal with best practice on what actually might work and linking it away from the schoolroom to parental uh, stimulus about aspects of all of this. Uh, and then uh, secondly, the, the pupil premium as to how, which you guys have done a very uh, important paper on recently. Uh, it's a dear essential thing to what Northern Powerhouse Partnership has been trying to preach for a while now, that they need to change the definition of it to the, the time length that a child is eligible, because that's a much better indication of true level of exclusion. Uh, and it's along with everything else that it even goes back to the brief time I was in government. The guy at the center, which in this case is Boris, has to tell all these different departments, you do not have a choice about opting in or out, you're in. And the Department of Education in particular needs to be stopped from thinking, you know, we're, we're a bit removed from all of this, we're above it all, because otherwise we won't get anywhere. Devolution, obviously central to it all. I, I would, it, it's very much away from the current thinking, but I would, I would personally believe, linked to the aspects of what I've said, bringing some parts of schooling back to having devolved capability, I think ultimately is a sensible thing to do. Thank you. So educational attainment, closing that gap and the role of devolution, two sustained themes. Julia, I'm guessing you might not disagree too much with those things, but now that you're, um, you've left the West Midlands, maybe you, uh, you can inject a bit of controversy for us. And I think also <laughs> as someone who spent a bit of time in the Treasury when devolution did feel like it was one of the priorities at the Treasury. So I thought maybe just talk a bit about some of the baggage that this whole agenda is, is trying to unpick. Some of it is political, I think. Some of it is actually institutional and about the bureaucracy as well part of the psychology of some of the way that departments work. Um, so I think before even you get to the 2019 election and the kind of red wall came to the fore and this kind of tension between is it towns or cities was brought out, it felt that devolution was in potentially quite a difficult space. Um, it was highly transactional. It was encouraging cities to compete against one another. Um, that's even before this whole, is it, you know, it's towns that are flavour of the month rather than cities. And in places like the West Midlands that aren't monocentric, you know, they've got multiple cities with ecosystems of towns that support them. They're all one kind of economic geography. It's not things that need to compete against each other. I think we've created this environment where a combination of the short term tactical politics of being able to almost in a pork barrel way say, look, this is what we're delivering for a spe this government is specifically delivering for this specific place. I think the combination of that and the psychology that, that Jim was talking about, where kind of departments are also quite protective of their fiefdoms, means that kind of where the broader inclusive growth, the levelling up agendas has been quite atomised. And you can absolutely see that in um, the delay to the levelling up white paper, um, the delay to the shared prosperity fund details, which was supposed to be this kind of unifying agenda. But, you know, we'll find out next week whether it will deliver that or whether it will be a ribbon around another fragmented um, bunch of funding. Um, I mean, even with yesterday's net zero strategy, actually, you know, really, really great to see the level of ambition. I still don't quite understand where the handoff is between um, <laughs> national actions that are going to need to be taken and the commitments that are being made at a place-based level to deliver on their commitments. So still lots more thinking that needs to be um, kind of unpicked, really, and, and spelled out. And, you know, we're in a place where the defaults are highly transactional. They're targeted. They're competitive funding applications. I mean, look at the transport, the Intercity Transport Fund again as well. Originally vaunted as a kind of devolved fund that would help unlock the infrastructure, moving very much towards a place of kind of, you know, send us your bids and central government will tell you how it, you know, what, how we think it stacks up. So it's like, I think the, the key question is, what do we collectively need to do to kind of reach escape velocity from, from that kind of environment? And, you know, there are lots of reasons to be quite pessimistic. I've talked about them, the, the way the system is atomized. Um, the public, it's quite interesting when you look at the polling because they will simultaneously say leveling up is the most important agenda to deal with, but at the same time are highly, highly cynical about um, not really understanding what it means <laughs> and kind of 
a default starting point of being quite cynical about the government's commitment to it. And I think the reason why it's so important that we try and find that escape velocity is because, as you know, as, as everyone has already said, we are a country that's deeply centralised. We have deeply ingrained inequalities, not just between regions, but within them as well. And all of them are now in the context of you know, a once in 100 years health crisis and a once in 300 years economic crisis. We know that inequalities are being cast in even starker relief. So if not now, then when are we going to do it? The reasons to be hopeful. Um, I think the jigsaw pieces are starting to fall into place. Personally, I think it's a great thing that we've got Michael Gove at the helm of the department kind of giving kind of, I don't know, a heavyweight sense to a department that has always struggled to have cross-government traction. He will absolutely be a radical reformer. Some parts of the system might not like that, but he will absolutely be radical. And I think that combined with bringing in Andy Haldane, bringing in Neil O'Brien, and actually having Simon Clark at the Treasury to bring them in too, you know, you can see that there are people that absolutely get that. You know, when Michael Gove in his conference speech talked about his kind of definition <coughs> of levelling up, it absolutely ticks the right boxes in terms of engaging local leaders and communities, in terms of bringing in the private sector, in terms of public services reform being an important part of that agenda and bringing about pride of, pride of place. All of those things are absolutely right. We're just at a point where we can't quite see how it's going to translate into reality. Like when we get to next week's spending review, is the Treasury going to break down the silos between different departments and show how this is a systems level approach? Are they going to show that they're going to put money into the public services reform agenda because you have to enable people to unlock their potential, not just through kind of education and skills, but actually I think public health is a really important route in, in terms of unlocking economic potential as well. You know, those are really big questions and I haven't seen that direction of travel yet of like how that's going to play out in some of those really important proof points that to come. So in terms of like, you know, what can different places do? What can central government do? I think for everyone kind of not losing sight of the citizen being at the heart of all of this for them it's not just about kind of the things that they can point to that create pride in their places fundamentally it is a big economic question of do i feel better off delivering level up in the context of rising inflation it's going to be really really hard to not underestimate the scale of that ch challenge and i think thinking about leveling up as a shared national mission that everyone has a responsibility to deliver at a neighbourhood, community, town, city, region, nationally. That national mission, I think we can all we should be trying to buy into. And I think even before we get into um, arguments about where power and resource should lie, there needs to be a space where places and government can have a shared conversation around what does this place need to succeed? What are all of the public resources and private resources that we can put kind of in the mix to help unlock that and that it, it just feels at the moment we've got a set of processes that make having that holistic conversation really really difficult mayors are absolutely um kind of ha uh, a lightning rod to bring those conversations together but how do we formalize it into the system so it just doesn't get atomized as it goes through whitehall um and i think treasury has to get in there understand it moves beyond competitive you know how do they use the fiscal levers that they have to have those cross-cutting conversations um you know, and that ultimately do get us into fiscal devolution. And then finally, for places, I think, you know, when I think about uh, my time at the West Midlands, um, levelling up isn't a new concept. It's, you know, the kind of inclusive growth concept is the thing that brought everybody to the table. And I think it's kind of not losing sight of that, not drinking the Kool-Aid and getting sucked into spending a lot of time kind of putting energy into very small scale bids, but understanding that actually there's a huge amount of resources that they can control and influence and how do they work effectively in their own place-based systems um, to use those resources effectively, basically. So like, what can we all do to make it a national mission rather than it kind of being reduced down into quite a polarized political debate, which I think would be the key thing that we really have to focus on. Thank you. Well, huge food for thought from um, all of our speakers. I think if I could just start on the devolution question, um, I've been really struck by the degree of consensus across the centre-left, centre-right media policy community commentariat, you know, whether it's the FT, the Times or whoever it might be, all calling for greater devolved powers to mayors, local council leaders, et cetera, et cetera, the role of regional government northern powerhouse and its equivalents and yet we had that delayed slash binned um devolution local recovery white paper there's been a kind of existential kind of angst in government over the recent months as to the extent to which 
Um, whilst I think place is going to be key, is that going to translate into more power and resources being devolved down? Or is, or is there going to be a kind of centralised version of place-based policy making? What do you think are the blockers in, and how long do you think the government can kind of last out against that wave of people demanding that this surely has to be the way that we can achieve levelling up? Um, Julia, and then working back through, do you, do you have a sense of what those blockers are? I think I do think some of it is political. So I think the fact that, you know, we have 10 mayoral combined authorities and eight of those combined authorities return Labour mayors does make it quite difficult. I think so I think government, but also the M10 have to think about what that means for what their shared priorities are, what are the things that they can agree on um, and just kind of not get sucked down to the lowest common denominator to the point of being meaningless. I do think that some of it is institutional as well, because the the reality of this very, very atomized system means that it's actually really, really hard to put all the pieces back up together and articulate the added value that kind of a place based approach delivers. So just as an example, um, the five year gateway review on the gain share, that process is only interested in a conversation around what the gain share in particular has delivered in terms of outcomes. Um, it's kind of for the broader conversation to try and say, well, actually, it's not just what this funding alone has delivered, it's what it's leveraged, bringing in other resources. So the, the risk is that government can be very specific about holding to account very individual tiny pots. It's a struggle on both sides to then demonstrate, not even that it adds up to more than the sum of the parts, but even what the sum of the parts is. Um, so that's where I think, you know, it's the systems and processes are as important as the kind of personality and the politics in terms of creating barriers to, to kind of moving this agenda forward, I think. I'd say three things, really, uh, two of which, two political things. First of all, uh, you know, the, the sort of obsession with the national tribal colour. I mean, you know, I, I went into Treasury to try and deliver on a lot of this and the obstinacy of, of both sides about which political party the mayor might be struck me as nuts, but it, it's lived on to this day. And it, obviously it's completely against the spirit of devolution to having an obsession like that, but it's, that's unfortunately some kind of real politic. The second one is even more annoying, is that in, inside uh, the Tory leadership, uh, it jumps from once, even though the same government essentially ran the country for the, was it, 11 years, you know, Theresa May would not allow the phrase Northern Powerhouse to be used simply because it was theirs. One of the reasons why this government talks levelling up it's because he doesn't like George Osborne. I mean, it's pathetic, frankly. And the, if they're serious, they've got to get away from that kind of petty nonsense. It's their own party. Um, the third thing is also, in many ways, equally frustrating, but it's a bit more a combination of awareness and, and real passion. So quite a lot of, the, and this goes way beyond the politicians, this is the, the bureaucratic system. There are, there are very few people that actually really ever look at any objective evidence of what's going on regionally. And, and the, there are one or two bits of evidence that some of this stuff might have worked a little bit. But you try talking to anybody around this square mile about that, I'm having a clue what you're talking about. And so it's like, what is the matter with you all? Is it you just don't basically really believe that any initiative about anything will ever work, which sometimes might be real in their heads. It's like, get real, you know. If, it's, if you really want to be in levelling up, get excited on it and really focus on what you're going to measure and look at some of the things that already have happened under a different name that might actually have an, have an influence. And you might feel good about it. I can see it's just, it's Yeah, it was just more in, like this kind of confusion that like control, central control doesn't equal agency. Um, right. And I think that's where kind of the pandemic probably made things a bit worse as well, because there was the sense that like we can't control, you know, unless we can control everything, we can't guarantee right. it's going to happen. Which really delivered success, right? Um, whereas actually, um, you know, there are some really great examples where kind of just sharing information, giving a little bit more control regionally does, doesn't mean there's a lack of transparency. It just means there can be more effective collaboration and impact. And I think sometimes 
it's quite difficult to to kind of land that point in a world where even with you know an ambitious agenda about moving Whitehall departments out into the different regions sure. of the country, a lot of senior civil servants spend a very small amount of time visiting places outside central London and and like sometimes just don't even understand the basic geography and even within departments you know can't join things up so <laughs> the West Midlands is hosting where is Carlisle you know, City of Culture <laughs> Commonwealth Games a 5G pilot all within one department and it can be really hard to have a joined up conversation about how those things can come together and, and kind of leverage impact let alone do that outside you know across departments well John I know you've had um some pretty good success in in uh in getting some of those different fragmented pots of funding. How are you trying to find a way to bring that together so that you can, you know, use the, those different monies to deliver your strategic objectives as a city? Well, I, I'd say three things, two things in your original question and one in that latter question. Um, I agree politics has got in the way and it's politics within my party and it's politics within the Labour Party. And it's also a conflict between politics nationally and locally. And it's quite interesting if you speak to a lot of the local mayors, they have far more cross-party collaboration and they have far more discussions with other parties. While nationally, it's very tribal. It's very, you know, government mm. in opposition and it's quite confrontational. Well, actually, the mayors, I think, are conversations I've had with mayors, they're indicating it's far more collaborative. And I think that's personally, a very healthy thing. The other interesting thing, I think, is civil service. They do not really want to see decentralization. And yes, you, you, Julie highlights the point about moving departments out. It's not the policy makers, it's not the decision makers. It's, uh, and that's not going to change anything. But on the local level, it's very interesting. One of the great frustrations of being a backbench MP after 11 years is you get to know ministers in a particular department, you're starting to work with local issues, mm -hmm. and then bang, they're gone and you start all over again and it's utterly frustrating. Well, actually, at the local level, you've got uh, yeah. chief executives and officers who've been there for five, ten years. They know what's going on locally. You have build up a relationship with them and actually you probably achieve more. And you've asked me specifically about Carlisle example. Over the last ten years, I've had a Conservative leader and a Labour leader of the council. But broadly speaking, I've had the same officers and we've worked together across the political divide, across the administrative um, divide as well. Uh, and they've been, I think, excellent. And it's because of that sort of continuity that we've managed to do, I think, quite a lot in Carlisle. Um, when I look at the national scene, when I've had ministers constantly changing, it's very, very frustrating when you're trying to achieve things with them. Well, actually, at the local level, quite often you can achieve things quite quickly and quite successfully because there's that continuity. So I think there's a number of issues. I mean, politics does get in the way. We can't get away from that. But I think if we could keep pushing on and demonstrate to government that it actually works at the local level, once they start to realise that, and I'm hoping Michael Gove is going to be the catalyst for the great change. I mean, I was hugely disappointed when um, George Osborne left because he had been the initial driver of all this. I just hope uh, Michael Gove takes up the, the baton and runs with it because... If he can't do it, I'm not sure anybody can. Well, we've talked about power, um, but I want to come to money next. We've touched on it a bit there. Jim, obviously, we've got the budget and the spending review mm -hmm. next week. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of pressure on the Chancellor to kind of demonstrate his fiscal conservativeness. Um, we're obviously waiting the OBR projections yeah. um, and, and a few kind of competing bits of data that are coming in as to what the UK's economic outlook is going to be. <coughs> but, you know, we calculated, for example, you mentioned the, the pupil premium in the report that we did with the Northern Research Group. We calculated that um, we could spend an extra two billion on expanding the eligibility for the pupil premium so that the, the bottom 40 percent of households would be covered and right. um, to, to receive that additional money. Yeah. Everyone's putting in their SR bids. To what extent are you hopeful that the government will focus things that um, you know can be um, loosely called social infrastructure, that preventative health, yeah. the educational attainment that, we, that you were talking about, as much as or, or more so potentially than kind of the more traditional capital intensive projects that yeah. particularly this government has become yeah. keen on? Well, we'll see, right? Um, I mean, it is really important. It's the first multi-year spending review we've had for quite some time. And uh, 
you know, I'm trained in the, that's probably a better guide to what a government's really serious about than the budget itself. So it's big. Um, listen, uh, what I get irritated just listening to your very <laughs> informed, no, it's, it's in respect of what you've, you've researched on. As I said earlier, I think the education reform or the mental approach to education changes that are needed are probably the most important ultimately. And what is so frustrating is they don't cost that much. And you just highlighted it with your definition of pupil premium. That's amongst the reoccurring things as to why it is so annoying. But, you know, and, and here there's a contradiction with, with Michael Gove, because of course, Michael in his life as the Department of Education sort of set the mantra for this centrally run academy based system. And, you know, that has its pluses and weaknesses. But it, it, over a decade later, it is not dealing with the most challenged places educationally. And we've got to get out of that. So some of it's nothing to do with the money, it's here. Uh, and, and, but when you come to the relative numbers, um, the numbers that are really needed to make a big difference over the long term in education are, are relatively small. You know, compared to 100 billion for HS2, you know, the, the productivity benefits, particularly post-COVID in my, in my view, dramatically more. Dramatically more, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I often change my. You know, I think Rishi himself occasionally gets this, but you have a prime minister that's obsessed about big projects, um, and a machine, partly because of the way the PM handles himself, institutionally and understandably, is slightly obsessed about the, you know the magic money tree and does have some obligation to saying we can't just spend on everything persistently. So it's a, you know, it's a tricky ball, the, the, the juggling here, but you know, we're going to find out pretty soon. Mm. John, did you want to... I mean, I'm an enthusiastic supporter of the pupil premium because it has actually demonstrated it has uh, improved an awful lot of yeah. people's lives. And two billion in the greater scheme of things is not a Penals. hugely significant amount of money. And I agree wholeheartedly that education is the main driver to improve people's lives. Um, and But I think we've also got to be careful of where the education, partly at school, but we've also got to look at colleges. Yeah, yeah. We've also got to look at what the local economy demands. Because if you know, I look at my own local economy, it's more about engineers, technicians, <laughs> rather than a huge number of university graduates. Well, other parts of the economy will need university graduates. And I think actually at the university level, we're in a pretty good place, generally. But I think it's uh, school education, technical education, college education. That's where I think the emphasis should be. Yeah, yeah I, I suppose the importance of capital infrastructure shouldn't be kind of just brushed to one side. In terms of connecting places and communities to economic opportunity is really, really important. I fear a bit for public services. Um, I think, you know, from a, an education point of view, the devolution of the adult education budget has shown that that kind of regional approach has been much better able to connect. But it finally happened, is it? Finally. Well, it's happened, but, you know, but then, but you need to be able to do more earlier in this, like, you know, what's yeah. next? How do you make the case for what's next? Whether it's careers, um, post six, you know, for, for younger age groups, how do you go down? And I, I just fear for, I fear for broader public services because for me, um, a lot of this kind of broader levelling up agenda as opposed to a very narrow one is about um, investment in early intervention. And, you know, local government has been at the sharp end of really, really tough spending rounds for the last 10 years. And, you know, as someone sat in the coalition government as a special advisor for the people, premier absolutely has made a difference, fundamental difference. But um, local government is being pinned down to their statutory responsibilities only. So where is the space to innovate, to support early intervention? That's the bit that I fear for. There is a bit of space for that in mayoral combined authorities, they, they're less constrained by those statutory responsibilities. But for me, that's the bit where I, it just feels like that's going to be hugely at risk in a multi-year spending round. Um, and, and I think that is a concern for delivering on that much broader agenda. Well, speaking of risk, I mean, it's, it's, it's risks that the, the Whitehall need to take on. I mean, you mentioned adult education budget and the devolution of that, you know, very, very small amounts of money. Um, other, other aspects it might be nominally devolved, but if you're compounding that by, you know, cuts to 
local government budgets, you're sort of tying places' hands behind their back before you can really then demonstrate the efficacy of, of devolution and, and the rest. I need a proper conversation around fiscal devolution. You know, they, right. for the last 10 years, it's been very much at the margins of, well, if Blame, we come up with any new taxes that we're not that bothered about collecting. But, you know, it's, a, it's about the sustainability of public finances, not just nationally, but kind of in those place-based systems as well. And unless you're prepared to put fiscal devolution on the table, then again, the parameters are just really, really tightly defined. It's really difficult to get any wiggle room. Well, let's explore that a little bit more because, I mean, one of the big questions is how do we pay for all this stuff? And, um, you know, we've seen that there's been a, an increase in national insurance contributions linked to um, tackling um, waiting lists in, in the NHS and then ultimately in social care. Um, Jim, I remember a programme you did for Radio 4 a few mm. months ago that was talking about potentially shifting to a Scandinavian type model. And, you know, many people... Um, within the Conservative Party or on the right more generally, and noting John here, here today interested in your views, would say, well, taxes are at record high levels, so there's not that much further to go. What would you say to that? Actually, I've got uh, an even more radical thing that maybe didn't come out in that programme. You know, from a, from a 40,000 foot macro perspective, what this crisis so far has demonstrated is all con conventional post-World -war, post War II or since the IMF was established 50 years ago, thinking on what is worrying levels of debt have been blown apart. And so what I really think is needed, which is not going to happen anytime soon, but we have the beginnings of thinking about it, is, is a much more sophisticated approach to the accounting of government spending in two ways. One is, let's call it a modern version of the Gordon Brown golden rule, in, in which you truly separate in almost every department other than treasury, what is investment spending and what is current consumption spending. And I think the markets, if it was done rigorously all around the world and the IMF approved for it, the markets would be perfectly at ease with that because it's the investment spending that creates, to put it in economics parlance, the multiplier effects. And in the way the world is, most of my adult life, and it's now probably going to be worse, as you touched on in some areas, you know, it's the easiest bit to crush because you save quick money there and nobody worries about the consequences because I might not be in power. And we're going to get out of that. Second thing, which is particularly valid for us, which again, another part of it, I have seen some Scandinavians think about this, and the current head of the OBR has done some interesting thinking about it as well, so it's maybe creeping more into debate, is, is actually trying to value some of our assets uh, that come from public expenditure as opposed to just regarding them as nothing. Because we've got to get out of this mental framework uh, of what is essentially an accounting game and it, it's, you know, I'm almost embarrassed to being a 45-year-old student of economics when I think how, how narrow-minded we've become about it all. On the tax thing, very quickly, you know, the, the most interesting thing to me in this regard is that the, the hostile opposition to tax increases that has been there also most of my adult life isn't there in opinion polls anymore, which is which might only be temporary, but the, it's, not, it's, not, it's not people clamoring for, you know, boot, raise my taxes, but the hostility against it, it's not there for the first time in 30 years. But I would love to see something a lot more on the first part of that. As, you know, in, in departments like health and in, in things that relate to this leveling up agenda, unless you do it that way, you can never get out of this bananas narrow accounting framework. Don, I have to come to you for yeah. your thoughts. Well, interesting enough, at present, I think 95% of all taxes are raised nationally. Yeah. And I just think the balance between central government and local government is completely out of sync. And if you look at all the other countries, European countries and America, it is a very different balance. And I would like to see a shift so that you actually have not just powers given to local communities right. and local leaders, but also responsibility. So they do actually have to think about right. what they're going to spend their money on because they've got to raise it locally as well. And I think that, that gives greater responsibility to those leaders. But the other thing I think we're missing here slightly, and we mustn't lose sight of it, we need to actually grow our economy. 
And the way, <laughs> you know, if we grow our economy, a lot of these problems will start to disappear. And the balance between London, as we started our conversation with today, and other cities in the north and other parts of the country, that gap has to be closed. And if we close that gap, it'll improve the overall balance within our national economy. It will raise an awful lot more funding through taxation, etc. And it will improve the lives of those communities that at present are, in my view, underperforming. I just want to bring in um, two questions that we've had from um, our audience and um, before we then um, go to final thoughts from everyone on the panel. Um, so there's one question from Stephen Boxall via Zoom, thank you, um, about the relative importance between connectivity within cities versus connectivity between cities. And I know when we were doing City Growth Commission, that was a, that was one major aspect that we mm. looked at, but from your West Midlands perspective, that's something I, I know will be, um, uh, that will resonate. And then John, you, you touched there on, on the idea of community and the importance of communities. Um, our second question from Kate Hainsworth, again via Zoom, is around um, the community sector, the voluntary sector and um, civil society. You know, we talk about local leadership, but how does this connect to real people on the ground and, and get them involved in thinking about this as well? So. Julia, and then we'll do final thoughts from each of you. Yeah, so I think I think I mentioned it before, really, but like it's not to kind of play down the importance of capital infrastructure. It's just it's necessary, but not sufficient. And again, thinking not just at the importance of HS2 in unlocking growth for the broader West Midlands, but actually that um, broader intra-regional transport next um, connectivity that's going to be so important to connecting the communities in a region to where there is economic opportunity. Um, the question around communities, it really makes me think about a lot of the work that went on into supporting the Community Renewal Fund um, at one level where, again, it's really, really, uh, this atomization of the system is actually a barrier, I think, to getting communities um, engaged and it needs to be properly again it's one of those things that it needs to be properly invested in and there has been some really great work in loads of different places um into in the broader community recovery from the pandemic that i think you know gives us some really good um case studies to work from and then just a final point on this kind of fiscal devolution you know, with the mayoral combined authorities there is a point of accountability um if that's what central government are, right. are worried about and i would just say the other thing to bear in mind is it's not just the the scepticism about kind of the revenue raising, it's um, the calculation around kind of invest to save, not just from a capital point of view and the work on the green book is really important starting to shift the dial, but also in public services as well. And I just think we need to be spending more energy in showing how that upstream intervention is generating savings further down the line. And then how do you capture that in kind of fiscal planning? And I don't think we do that as a country very effectively at the moment. So, and there's an opportunity to commercialize that as well if we get it right. So I think that's where we need to spend some time to try and unlock the resource. Cool. And then a minute each, please, Jim. Well, listen, the first of those two questions um, depends where in the country you're talking about. I, I, um, if I was forced to not have that caveat, it would be within cities. Because I think about, you know, the best way of answering it, Manchester's GVA, Manchester itself's GVA has outperformed London the, the past six years collectively, but Greater Manchester hasn't. So it's got to be better connection to the towns around it, both locally and further. But in the same breath, uh, to make a true difference, going right back to the core of what the Cities Growth Commission was all about, because you happen to have in the north of England so many places so close together, if you can create a proper economic unit, that is a national British game changer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And finally, John. I mean, building on that point, it's like building a counterweight to London, isn't it? Yeah. So you've actually got two economic centres, yeah. both of which are performing at a national level. So, I mean, I completely agree with that. I, I would summarise three key things, which I said at the outset. Skills and education <laughs> are very important. Devolution, I think, is the, one of the game changers because I think that changes the dynamics. Uh, and you can't get away from the fact private sector investment is so important because ultimately it's the private sector that's the wealth creators and it's through private sector success that you get the taxes that pay for our public services. But it's those three things. And I think they're all challenging for the government because at present, uh, private sector investment tends to go to you know Cambridge, Oxford, yep. uh, London. How do you incentivize it to, to other stone. parts of the country? Um, skills, putting serious money into it, 
and then being brave with devolution, being brave. Well, we've got to end there, but I think there's a call on government to be brave on devolution, spend in education and skills, get its own house in order and think about its internal system reform and how that can really un unlock all of these things. I think we've shown that cities have their place on the map uh, and justifiably so, but we need to think more in terms of kind of wider functional econo economic geography and the complexity of our um, urban rural um, economic geographies. And then I think finally, I would just end to say, you know, we're all waiting for this uh, levelling up white paper. Um, we're all waiting for the SR and, and the budget next week. But we're already seeing places that are getting on and doing and making the most of what they've got, working with the private sector, working with their local universities and other networks, um, be those grassroots or otherwise, to make their places better for their citizens. And uh, that's what gives me hope. So thanks so much for joining this session. And thank you to our fantastic speakers, Juliet, Jim and John. Thank you. Thank you.